Hey, ¿qué onda? Soy Raisa. ¿Cómo están el día de hoy? Espero que estén muy bien. El día de hoy les traigo un video bastante espeluznante. ¿Qué saben ustedes de los fantasmas? ¿Qué saben de los espíritus? La idea de los fantasmas está presente en prácticamente todas las culturas. Son almas que se quedaron atrapadas entre este mundo y el otro. Ya sea por muertes violentas, por maldiciones o en muchas ocasiones por asuntos pendientes. Existe un lugar en el que han ocurrido muchísimas, muchísimas muertes. Mi hermana Reni y yo tenemos planeado ir a Salem, la ciudad conocida como la capital de las brujas. En el año de 1692 ocurrió una tragedia horrible. Empezaron los juicios de las brujas. Se torturaron y se asesinaron a muchísimas personas las cuales sospechaban que eran brujas. El tema de brujería, el tema de espíritus, a mí me encanta, creo que es algo que quiero investigar más. Así que, ¿qué les parece si vienen conmigo y con mi hermana a esta ciudad llena de historia, magia y espíritus? Después de todo un día de dificultades para poder llegar a Salem, hoy tenemos una aventura nocturna en la que un investigador paranormal de Salem nos va a llevar por diferentes lugares escalofriantes y vamos a tratar de ver si capturamos espíritus y pues a ver qué pasa. La verdad es que no sé qué esperar, lo que sí les puedo decir es que me va muy de frío. Welcome to Salem Night Tour. We're going to be talking a lot about the real Salem witch trials. We're going to be talking a lot about Salem's history following the witch trials. We're also going to be talking a fair amount about ghosts and the paranormal. You definitely want to keep your phones ready um, as we're going along. This is one of Salem's oldest churches. It's called St. Peter's Church. Dates back to 1833. The history of this church, though, and the land that it's standing on, that goes all the way back to the Salem Witch Trials of 1692. It begins with a man named Philip English, one of Salem's wealthiest merchants. He was a member of the church that was dominant in England, so the Puritans of Salem did not like Philip English because his religion was the minority and it was not of the church that they believed in. Um, even worse was that the Puritans did not like his lifestyle. He had money, he could afford to indulge himself. So the Puritans thought this was sinful. Philip English was a smart man. He saw how chaotic the Salem witch trials were becoming here. He saw that he was probably going to be targeted as an accused witch. So he and his wife pretty much had to skip town overnight when things reached a breaking point. They went to New York State and they rode out the rest of the Salem witch trials there. In 1690, Philip English returned to Salem after everything was all over to reclaim all of the properties and assets he had had to leave behind so abruptly um, during the witch trials. He found that a young man by the name of George Corwin had seized all of his properties in his absence. He was 26 years old at the time of the witch trials and entrusted with a lot more power and responsibility than we would give most 26-year-olds today. His uncle, Jonathan Corwin, was one of the judges on the Salem witch trials, and we believe that his uncle had a hand in getting him that position. George Corwin was a hothead, a little bit arrogant, and he also had a little bit of a sadistic streak going on. He tortured at least one of the people who had been accused of witchcraft here in Salem to death. There are rumors in town that have not been verified. He also maintained a torture chamber of his own at his private residence. He was also fond of taking things that didn't belong to him because their rightful owners were tied up with witchcraft charges. Philip English came back to Salem and he was furious that George Corwin had just 
has taken all of these properties. He entered into a years-long legal dispute with George Corwin and his family that was still unresolved just a couple of years later when George Corwin died at the ripe old age of 30 of blood disease. At that point, Philip English was so furious and frustrated with the situation that he decided to take matters into his own hands. He seized George Corwin's corpse and refused to release it to the Corwin family for burial until he had given him some restitution for what was taken from him. Now, obviously, the Corwins were horrified by this turn of events. They entered into an agreement with Philip English pretty soon after that that included the plot of land that we're standing on right now. Now, Philip English held onto this land for a couple of decades, and then in 1733, he decided he was going to donate this plot of land for the construction of the first Anglican church in Salem. The Puritans who were dominant here, they had pretty much fizzled out at that time. There was a bit of a problem because it was already being used as a graveyard. Philip English had to move all of the tombstones to what is now the front of the church and build the original St. Peter's Church right over all of the bodies in the ground. As you can imagine with the disturbed gravesite, we have a certain amount of paranormal activity that gets reported from this place. People who work in the church regularly report hearing the sounds of children laughing and playing in the chapel. I've seen some really compelling images of what look like shadow figures standing among the graves, peering out from behind the tombstones. Ya quiero tomar las fotos en las tumbas. Dicen que ya han pasado, que capturan cosas, entonces vamos a ver qué tal. So you guys are sitting, standing, and or leaning on the site of the dungeon where the accused were held in 1692. The original jail was here during Puritan times, was torn down in 1956, and this building built in its place some years later. When they were digging out the foundations for this building, they found wooden beams with shackles affixed to them in the ground. There was another method of confinement that was commonly used in the witch dungeon that was even worse, everybody. Coffin cell, and it is exactly what it sounds like. People were kept in these coffin cells for months at a time. And what's even worse is that as soon as you got locked up in one of these things, you started racking up a bill. They charged you for room and board. They charged you for whatever meager rations of food that you got during the day. One of the primary factors that was motivating the Salem witch trial. Read. At a certain point, it became profitable for the Salem government. Anyone want to take a guess as to the age of the youngest person that was in prison here? Five. It's actually four years old. This little girl girl's name was Dorcas Good. You may have heard her mother's name around town. Sarah Good is one of the names that we remember from the witch trials. She was the second person to be hanged for witchcraft here in Salem. Um, Sarah and Dorcas were street people in 1692. Sarah had been brought up in a very wealthy family um, in one of the neighboring towns of Salem, but through a series of misfortunes in her life, she was completely penniless by 1692. She was pregnant and estranged from her husband. She and her four-year-old daughter were not considered the most reputable people around town. People say that she looked a lot older than she was. She was 38 at the time of the witch trial. People would say that she'd go around town muttering to herself. Um, so Sarah Good was one of the first to be arrested because she was a very easy target. They apprehended Sarah and they brought her four-year-old daughter in for questioning separately. They held her for two weeks and questioned her incessantly about the accusations against her mother. She finally broke down. She testified against her own mother and she also implicated herself. We think that she told the story that she did because she was trying to find a way to get back to her mother. She said that Sarah had brought her a little snake and had the snake drink her blood. This was what was referred to as a familiar in the lore surrounding witchcraft. This was a little demon or spirit that took the shape of an animal that the devil gave to witches to help them with their craft and they stripped her down and searched her body for physical evidence. They came up with a little red mark on her skin that they said looked like a snake bite. And if you couldn't find a witch's mark, a mole would do just as fine. So this happened again and again during the witch trials. You can't say that any of the people who were accused of witchcraft here had the right to a fair trial. La verdad que fuerte. Yeah. Para una niña de cuatro años es, es horrible. 
This was the site of a tavern owned by Bridget Bishop, one of the first people to be accused of witchcraft here in Salem. She was also the very first person to be executed on witchcraft charges here. First of all, Bridget Bishop was a property owner, unlike many women back in the day. She was also a little bit of a party girl by Puritan standards. She smoked and she drank. She talked freely to all kinds of men. She also had a bit of a reputation as a black widow because she was on her third husband at the time of the witch trial. The Two previous husbands had died under suspicious circumstances. He had also inherited those properties from the two previous husbands. Bridget Bishop had a criminal record behind her. She was known for getting into public fights with her third husband on the streets of Salem. But the final nail in her coffin was the prior accusation of witchcraft. Bridget Bishop was hanged from a very short rope and pretty much left to strangle. Death was agonizing and it could take hours. And it should come as no surprise that her spirit is still pretty restless these days. People are walking up and down this alleyway at night. They'll sometimes get a sudden whiff of apple blossoms, which is believed to indicate the presence of her spirit. People who work in Turner's Seafood also report seeing her walking up and down the stairs of the building on a pretty regular basis. Tomé varias fotos en ráfaga para ver si logramos capturar algo. Me gustaría poderlo investigar porque como es un restaurante, no es un lugar en el que te puedas quedar. Esta última historia nos habla de una mujer un poco más adelantada a su época, más libre. Ella manejaba sus negocios y todo. Y es muy triste como es que a esas personas eran las que las acusaban de brujas. In 1692, a witchcraft accusation automatically made you ineligible for Christian burial. So we don't have any of the accused buried here, but we do have two of the judges who served on the witch trial, including Judge John Hawthorne, the infamous hanging judge. He earned that nickname because he was the guy who was signing the execution papers, and by all accounts, including his own, he did so with great relish. This house that overlooks the cemetery, this is the Grimshaw House, named after an unfinished novel by John Hawthorne's great great grandson, Nathaniel Hawthorne. He's one of our most beloved American authors. Um, this is the guy who brought us the Scarlet Letter. On one of his visits, he was sitting in the parlor of this house working on his writing. He said that a ghost entered the room with him through the wall facing the cemetery here. He stood with him for a few minutes and then it vanished again into thin air. That places the haunting of this house back almost 200 years. And guys, there's still a lot of activity going on here today. I've gotten some really compelling photos of faces in the windows of the side of the house that faces the cemetery here. Every now and then people will get a videos of what appear to be little orange lights dancing around. So if you go into the cemetery, there's a big oak tree. It's called the lightning tree. And if you look at the trunk, you'll see why. Half of the trunk is completely warped and burned from being struck repeatedly by lightning year after year. If you look a little bit more closely at the lightning tree, you'll see that it's growing out of a grave. The grave of a young man named Caleb Pickman, who lived in Salem in the early 1700s. Uh, Mr. Pickman's cause of death is engraved on his marker. Does anyone want to take a guess as to what killed this young man? Lightning. Lightning, absolutely. It's incredible what he told us about the cemetery. The person died because he fell in a ray, and the ray is still falling on the tree. murder happened in this house. In 1830, a man by the name of Captain Joseph White was found dead in his bedroom. A wealthy sea captain who had made a fortune in the slave trade. Certainly not something to be proud of. Captain White, though, was a little bit different. He had no regrets whatsoever. He had lots of money, and he was fond of showing everybody between all this wealth, all this greed, and between these horrible racial attitudes, you come as no surprise that somebody in Salem wanted this old guy dead. On the morning of April 9th, 1830, Captain White's live-in handyman noticed that there was a wooden plank against one of the windows in the back here. He immediately suspected a break he ran inside, he notified everybody that was home at the time, and they found a horrifying scene. He was lying face down on his bed with the back of his skull completely fractured. He also had 17 stab wounds in the vicinity of his heart. People were terrified because a motive for the crime was not clear from the get-go. None of those riches that were lying around the captain's house, none of them had been touched. And people began to suspect that there was a madman on the loose in Salem. And then, one of the investigators took a closer look at the crime scene and noticed that something was in fact missing. That was the captain's will. In 1830, if you died without a will, 
all of your fortune automatically went to your next of kin. His closest relative was his niece, a woman by the name of Mary Beckford who lived in the house with him at the time of the murder. Mary Beckford had a daughter whose name was also Mary, and the younger Mary was married to a man whose name was also Joseph. We have two Marys and two Josephs. The younger Joseph was a local troublemaker. Captain White was sure that Joseph Knapp had only married into the family because he wanted his hands on a bit of the captain's money. And in this at least, Captain White was correct. Joseph Knapp was not happy with the amount of money that had been allotted to Mary Beckford in the will. He knew that if the captain died without that will, that all of the money would go to Mary Beckford, would trickle down to her daughter, and by extension, make Joseph Knapp a millionaire. He enlisted the help of the Crown and Shield brothers, Richard and George, who were not afraid to get their hands dirty um, to get a little bit of extra cash on the side. A couple of days after the captain was murdered, Richard and George were out drinking. Richard had a little bit too much and he admitted that, yeah, he might have had something to do with what happened here on the morning of April 9th. The wrong person overheard that boast and it got both of the brothers sent to jail, where Richard killed himself shortly thereafter. After. The case did eventually go to trial. Um, Richard Crown and Shield was found to be the culprit. Joseph Knapp was sentenced to hang conspiracy charges. And in the end, all of the captain's relatives ended up with exactly the amounts of money that the captain had intended for them to get. Because the will that the Crown and Shield brothers removed from this house and destroyed was a fake. The real will was in the captain's lawyer's office. This house survives into our present day pop culture through the board game Clue. Very affectionately refer to this place as the Clue House. House. This is also Salem's most haunted mansion, everybody. Um, the captain's spirit is definitely still banging around in the walls of this house. I've gotten some really compelling images of scary faces looking right back at me from these windows. Bueno, con esto terminamos el tour de todas las historias fantasmales de Salem. Lo que vamos a hacer ahorita es regresar, analizar todo el material que capturamos y ahorita me lo reporto con ustedes porque tenemos que regresar rápido o si no, no vamos a poder eh, subirnos al tren. Así que vamos rápido. Ya regresamos, ya terminó el viaje en donde tuvimos un montón de cosas que nos pasaron llegar y poder salir de Salem y poder llegar y podernos ir de Nueva York, fue un caos. Pero bueno, vamos a ver el material que capturamos, vamos a ver si aparece algo. El investigador que nos estaba dando el recorrido nos recomendó que tomáramos las fotos así en ráfaga para que pudiéramos Ajá. capturar algo en ese momento. Pues era un investigador paranormal con licencia de historiador y todo. Y nos dijo, o sea, cómo tomar las fotos donde no se tú mismo, o no sean sombras, o no sea de dónde, para que sea legítimo. Creo que la energía se puede sentir encima de todo. Han pasado un montón de cosas ahí. Definitivamente hay algo ahí. Sí. Nos dijeron que donde había más actividad, donde por lo regular se veían cosas, es en el pequeño cementerio que está en la iglesia. Esas son las tumbas. Incluso a veces no parecían reales, pero sí eran reales porque sí, tienen delgaditas, grises, Ajá, así. tenían justo la formita de las tumbas que te ponen para cosas de Halloween. Y bueno, por aquí creo que no hay nada. Bueno, si ustedes ven algo, también recuerden irlo comentando aquí eh, abajo. Ok, es el video que grabé de... Ah, de la iglesia. Se ve muy escalofriante de noche, la verdad. No, creo que no capture nada. Cuando menos no que yo pueda ver. Esta es el área donde pasaron las cosas más fuertes. Porque es donde se hacían los juicios a las brujas. Así ah, creo que aquí no tomamos ninguna foto ni nada. No, porque Simplemente... nos dijo que lo ponía. Porque nos comentaba que en este lugar, como ya sabían los de ahí, que por estas fechas se hacen recorridos, dijo que es muy común que los de ahí jueguen bromitas. Me gustaba que estaba abierto al tema, pero sí descartaba ciertas cosas para que no en automático todo fuera claro o prueba de algo paranormal. Sí. Muy bien, bueno, lo siguiente es que llegamos a un restaurante. Aquí supuestamente estamos hablando de un área con mucha actividad paranormal, entonces vamos a ver si capturamos algo. Ok... Me llamó la atención que cuando lo abrí se fue directo hacia la ventana de arriba, pero está oscura, entonces no puedo ver mucho. Se me hace extraño esto de aquí arriba, ¿sabes? Esto. Se me hace extraño porque no, no lo capturé, o sea, no está tan pegado a la luz de la calle. Esto está extraño, es una manchita en la foto. Está raro, porque no está cerca de la luz de la calle ni nada. Está raro. A ver, espérate aquí. ¿Está diferente? Sí. ¡Uy! ¿Qué es esto? Y, o sea, era una bolita así como, oh, pero ahora está así. Lo tomé en ráfaga, como les digo. No sé, o sea, siento que hasta allá arriba no refleja la luz de las cosas. Eso es lo primero raro que vemos. Además, es curioso porque es el área que les digo que hay como mucha actividad paranormal sí. que está documentada. Esta es 
una casa muy interesante porque está justo enfrente del cementerio y al parecer ocurren muchísimas cosas ahí, vamos a ver si logramos capturar algo. Para empezar algo que me llama la atención es que desde aquí se ve un poco iluminadas las ventanas, pero creo que en esta no veo nada, es el arbolito, no, aquí no capturé nada, veamos la siguiente. ¿Qué es esto? Reflejo de calle ¿Segura? Y por acá se ve como una lucecita Y nos dicen que se ven lucecitas No, este es reflejo de calle Me llama la atención que una de las luces sea naranja Y comenta mucho que se ven luces naranjas Pero es que no es naranja, es el color de la de la calle Creo que lo interesante aquí también es el ambiente Se siente como que algo va a pasar Luego aquí tenemos el cementerio Por lo regular te dejan entrar al cementerio Pero como estaban haciendo unas construcciones En esta ocasión no nos dejaron Ok, por ahorita no veo nada Otra vez esta lucecita Según yo, esa es la luna Es muy chiquita para hacer la luna Pero tapada Es el mismo tipo de luz Lucecita que capturamos hace rato. Oh, no lo sé. Es el mismo tipo de lucecita que capturamos hace rato. Y si fuera luz de la calle o algo por el estilo, estaría ahí ya desde el principio. Pero además, ¿contra qué reflejaría? ¡Es un árbol! Pero de todas maneras, no hay, no hay una ventana o algo así para reflejar esa lucecita. ¿Y cómo puede ser luz de calle atrás si está arriba? O sea, como sea, es un puntito muy parecido al otro. Es, es algo, no sé, está raro Le doy el beneficio de la duda Y además es sobre el cementerio No hay algo ahí que refleje Mejor es una estrella No es una estrella, Renata, por Dios Además yo siento que el hecho de que no lo estamos capturando en las tumbas O en un punto que está en el piso le agrega algo Porque es, es el cielo, no puedes reflejar algo en el cielo tan fácil y luego falta, lo último fue esta casa, ¿no? Esta casa tiene una historia muy interesante. Es la casa el, de la que se inspiraron para hacer el juego de mesa de Clue. Nos dijeron que a veces se alcanzan a ver personas en la ventana también. Se ve algo en la ventana verde, pero voy a darle el, el beneficio de la duda de que es el árbol. Creo que no, pero está demasiado oscuro. No, creo que no. Bueno, ahora sí, es momento de nuestras conclusiones de esta primera parte que fue aprender sobre los espíritus y los fantasmas de la historia de Salem. ¿Tú cómo te sentiste? La verdad es que me gustó mucho. Fueron muy respetuosos ante lo que pasaba en Salem. Se me hace extraño que pongan tanto de que ven a conocer el pueblito de las brujas y de las brujas. O sea, como que están celebrando el genocidio de personas. Cuando entras ya ves que la gente sí lo toma con mucho respeto. Que aquí pasó y esto estuvo mal y esto estuvo mal. Eso me gustó bastante. Lo que nos platicaban de las historias No todas estaban relacionadas con la cacería de brujas Por ejemplo, la última casa Era un caso totalmente distinto Yo, personalmente, siento que Me gustó mucho haber aprendido más Y se siente algo Que aunque no lo puedas ver, sabes que hay algo ahí Hay cierta energía, cierto poder Y también siento que era como Entrar a los 1600 Te transportaba un chorro y como te decía las historias Como que si sí podías imaginarte O sea, si estaban aquí o si te podías ver a gente caminando vestida de época, no sé. Creo que se han esforzado mucho por preservar las cosas históricas. Yo no soy muy miedosa para nada, pero sí sentía algo. Yo creo que la verdad fue una experiencia increíble. Lo que sí me llama la atención es la mala suerte que ha acompañado traerles este video. De verdad, llegar ahí fue increíblemente difícil. Todas las tragedias que han ido acompañando la creación de este video. Eso ya fue todo, espero que les haya gustado cazar fantasmas con nosotras, pero aquí no termina nuestra aventura de Salem, todavía tenemos un video más, una de cierta manera segunda parte, pero en esta ocasión vamos ahora sí meternos bien en el mundo de las brujas. Sigue la parte más icónica de Salem. No olviden acompañarnos en el siguiente video también, si encontraron algo, si sintieron algo ustedes, si ustedes notaron algo que nosotras no, lo pongan aquí abajo en los comentarios para que podamos seguir discutiendo todo o nos lo digan por nuestras redes sociales les voy a dejar los links a mis redes aquí y también en la descripción y las de Reni van a estar todas en la descripción para que nos vayan a seguir para que sigan platicando con nosotras y todo díganos también aquí en los comentarios cuál de todas las historias fantasmales que nos contaron aquí les gustó más a ustedes esto ya fue todo pero nosotros vemos en la parte 2 bye bye, bye.